Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Karem Mutlu. And on today's show, we have Dan Blondel, who's the CEO of Nano One Material Corp. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's begin by talking about your background in the tech sector and how that led to your involvement within the battery space for electric vehicles. And I want to understand the journey you've had so far within this space. Can you give us a brief overview of your career so far? Yeah, sure, Karim. Uh, uh, so I'm an engineer. Uh, I actually started in mining uh, in the in the late 80s at doing materials handling, at, but then I shifted more into technology, medical devices, commercial printing. I ended up working for Kodak for many years. Uh, nuclear, I was in the nuclear industry. And then funny enough here, I, I find myself back in materials, but this time focused on, on lithium-ion batteries. Okay, well, let's delve into the technology a bit more. As a new technology starts to go into the mainstream and for investors who are positioned to see this growth, the opportunities can be great if you are patient enough to see the story play out. So in your view, are we still in the beginning stages of the story for battery storage and electric vehicles? And is the growth of the industry set to continue for, say, the next decade at least? What are your thoughts? So, so we uh, obviously we, we hear a lot in the media, uh, certainly in the West, about uh, about electric vehicles from Tesla, BMW, Volkswagen, GM. Uh, these are all kind of long range luxury electric vehicles, and and surely there's going to be continued growth in that space. But there's also huge growth in in the industrial and home storage space. That would be energy uh, that's pulled out of the renewable grids and into uh, into batteries for use at a later time. Uh, there's there's buses and other fleet vehicles, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, I, I hope, in, in detail. Um, uh, there's low-range and low-speed electric vehicles, which don't get a lot of media attention, but are are, um, are are seeing massive adoption in places like China and India. There's bikes, there's scooters. There's even a huge opportunity to replace lead acid with uh, what's called a lithium iron phosphate battery to address a growing kind of lead-related environmental crisis. So uh, this is definitely the beginning, and there's much growth to come, uh, whether you're looking at mining or the end product. Let's talk a bit about uh, lithium and the type of lithium that is needed for batteries. I understand that lithium hydroxide is essential for these batteries. Can you talk a bit about that? And can you give us your current views on this market? I understand the supply is very low, but the demand is still rising for this type of lithium. But lithium is mined from salty lake cellars in South America or hard rock in Australia and a number of other places. But to be useful in a battery, that uh, that lithium that comes out of the mine must be further refined into a highly purified form and it, it, as a metal or a specialty chemical such as lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate. And uh, there's been a surge in demand for lithium hydroxide uh, because they're be largely because of the Chinese push for long range uh, vehicles using low cobalt nickel rich batteries. But um, as it turns out, it's quite difficult to make those batteries. And what we're seeing is that demand is actually shifting back to lower range uh, nickel manganese cobalt based batteries and lithium iron phosphate batteries that can be made with lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. So I, I think we'll see a seesaw between uh, lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide as industry figures out where the sweet spot is. But overall, the supply and demand will probably be quite tight for the foreseeable future. Uh, so as you say, demand is increasing. Um, supply isn't, uh, isn't uh, picking up as quickly as everyone would like because it's, it's, it's hard to bring battery-grade materials online. So I think we'll, we'll see a very tight supply chain uh, probably for the next five years. For most investors who are interested in the electric vehicle and battery space, there are always changing dynamics about the battery chemistry and the rise of solid state batteries. So from what you see within the industry, are solid state batteries going to become a bigger part of the future for batteries and battery storage? Absolutely. Um, um, I should probably t describe to your uh, listeners what a solid state battery is. Um, it's, a solid state battery is still a lithium ion battery. Um, essentially, what you do is you replace the liquid electrolyte in a in a conventional lithium ion battery with a solid electrolyte material that's made of glass or ceramic or some kind of a plastic polymer based material. And um, you still have a cathode, 
So regardless of it being solid or liquid electrolyte, there still will be rising demand for lithium, nickel, cobalt, iron, phosphate. So none of that really changes. Uh, the solid electrolyte does, however, have the potential to uh, eliminate separators. That's one of the components within the lithium-ion battery. It gets rid of the flammable liquids, and which makes it a much safer battery. And ultimately, uh, solid-state batteries will replace graphite. Uh, with an ultra thin lithium anode, so further increasing the demand uh, for for lithium, and so this all means a safer, denser, thinner battery. Uh, but uh, having said all that, there's lots of work to be done, and uh, the commercial adoption will be uh, gradual, uh, probably over the next ten years, and you'll start to see it emerge with consumer electronics, or maybe maybe even a more sort of niche products like. Uh, um, like the drone industry or, or various places like that where, where, uh, where, you know, consumers are willing to pay for a, a costly battery before the manufacturing uh, gets up to speed and costs start to come down. Earlier in the interview, Dan, you mentioned China, and I just want to understand how important China is as a dominant player within the electric vehicle space, not only within the adoption of electric vehicles, but partly due to the heavy subsidies that are now beginning to scale back. Do you see them building their own brand of electric vehicles and how important this is in a shift towards them leading this industry? And this leads me on to the question of has the race for countries to lock up supplies for materials going forward already begun? Uh, you know, China really has two key objectives, I think, uh, in, in terms of electric vehicles. The first one is th they're looking to decarbonize their cities. Uh, let's face it, there's lots of news about them choking on smog, and uh, and it's, it's a sort of primary objective of the whole uh, electrification of their vehicles is to decarbonize their cities. But really, underlying all of this is the will to dominate the electric vehicle space, whether that be in the in uh, in, in buses or in batteries or uh, in in electric vehicles, so they've they've put uh, all kinds of incentives into place, uh, as as you mentioned, and some of those are beginning to taper off. Um, and they put the markets in place, and they've been locking up uh, raw material supply chain for years now, in anticipation of the huge rise of demand that has come from both from their incentives and uh, and their key objectives. And it's not just with uh, with cars. Uh, there's half a million electric buses on the road in China, and that's going to double by 2025. Uh, there's another million e-taxis coming to China in 2025. There's a th these are massive trends, and China gets to figure out all of this in their own backyard. And uh, iron out all the kinks while the West uh, is focused on more sort of long range electric vehicles. So you can expect China to come sort of bursting out of their market uh, with very much entry level electric vehicles. So it will address the, uh, the, the low end of the market uh, while, uh, while at the same time uh, perfecting what they do on the, on the luxury end of things. So uh, I have, uh, uh, you know, I, I certainly expect that China will drive this industry, uh, excuse the pun, for, uh, for some time to come. Excellent. Okay, as we begin to wrap up the show, Dan, is there anything else you wish to talk about or share with our listeners today? Well, listen, you know, um, I think uh, the, 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 maybe the important thing to, to realize is, is that uh, we are at the beginning of, uh, of what is to be a very large market in lithium-ion batteries, whether it be from vehicles or grid storage or consumer electronics. Um, we've seen it grow in consumer electronics, and we will expect to see it go into uh, bigger and bigger industrial applications. Uh, Nano One's near-term strategy is with lithium iron phosphate, and so that's a material used in all those buses and taxis and energy storage batteries that I talked about earlier. It's a very bright future. There's lots of growth. There's lots of shifting trends. We are only at the beginning. And, uh, and we're well positioned with an agnostic technology uh, to, to move with the market and innovate and, and to drive the industry. So we're very much looking forward to this. OK, well, thank you very much for your time today, Dan. And I'm sure we'll have you back on the show later in the year. Thank you, Karim. It's a pleasure to be here. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?